Hello once again, everybody. Thank you for joining me here on this special edition of Bang the Book Radio for Wednesday, July 30th. I'm your host, Adam Burke. We're going to chat some college football and some NFL preseason with professional handicapper Brian Leonard from wagertalk.com. Be good to get Brian back on the program here. We'll chat some Mac, obviously, as we almost always do with Brian. We'll talk some AAC, then also discuss the NFL preseason, including Thursday night's Hall of Fame game. So just a couple of days away from having actual football to bet on. I know everybody is very excited about that. As you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the Sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. Lots of stuff going on over at bangthebook.com here right now. We've got a preview for tonight's Chicago versus Connecticut game in the WNBA. College football division and conference season win total articles being posted by our talented cast of writers. Divisions for the group of five, or for the power five, excuse me, full conferences for the group of five. I've written up several of those over at the website for you to check out. Our NFL season win totals have been up for a while as well. Daily baseball, weekly soccer, golf, NASCAR, tennis, UFC, you name it. We've got it over there at bangthebook.com. Coming up the rest of the week here on Bang the Book Radio, I'll chat with Ross Tucker, former NFL player and now of the Ross Tucker Football Podcast family. We'll talk with him about the NFL preseason, also get some of his thoughts going into the regular season. Thursday, the betters box. Friday, Christian Pina of the Sports Gambling Podcast to chat some UFC with us. So busy week on Bang the Book Radio, busy week over at bangthebook.com, as it should be here as we're ramping up for all the stuff that's coming our way in the next few weeks go ahead and bring on today's first and only guest professional handicapper brian leonard from wagertalk.com brian how's it going today man everything's going great it's glad to be able to talk a little bit of football and glad to be back on the show yeah man good to have you back on the program how's your summer going everything going well yeah everything's going fine here um just dealing with some grasshoppers out here in vegas but uh that's the worst thing we've got to worry about and when things are going well it's uh yeah, it's been a nice summer. It hasn't been too hot, although it's been about 100, 110 or whatever. A lot of people feel that's pretty hot. But, hey, you can always go into the casinos because they can freeze you out in no time doing that. So, uh, yeah, enjoying my summer out here in Vegas. Got a new baseball stadium. I know you're, as, you're a baseball fan like I am. And been to a few games. And, uh, yeah, it's been a good year. No, good. Glad to hear it. And uh, I got to ask, man, this grasshopper thing, I know you don't go out, you don't go down to the strip much. Obviously, a lot of people that live out there don't go down to the strip very often unless somebody's in town. But seeing some of those videos, seeing some of the pictures, uh, it, it does not look particularly enjoyable. And, and I mean, I'm somebody when I go out there, I like to relax. I'll gamble at night, but I'll spend all day by the pool. I've heard the pools are just full of the grasshoppers. Is it as bad as it looks out there? Well, it's funny because this happened maybe 15 years ago. I'm thinking that it, it just got crazy with the grasshoppers. Normally, we don't see any, but it's just uh, based on the weather. And you would go to pump your gas, and because they have the infrared lights and, and everything, it's so it's so light at, at night, there's grasshoppers flying all over the place. Uh, if you go during the day, it's not so bad. I'm more of a day person than a night person anyway. But uh, in, in the local neighborhoods, it's not bad. I mean, uh, we haven't had any get in the house or anything like that. Uh, but uh, if you go out at night, and you can see and We actually went down the strip a couple of days ago. We went to see a show at uh, the Wynn. And because the strip is so lighted, because of the lights, everybody knows the lights on the strip, uh, they're all attracted to the lights. And it's just amazing. I saw a video. It looked like it was in front of uh, uh, across the street from Treasure Island there where they got a couple of casinos and some shops or whatever. But they had the whole sidewalk blocked because there was grasshoppers everywhere. And my wife went out the other day and she was leaving the casino and uh, she could hear the grasshoppers being crunched under her tires as she was driving. Uh, but it's it's you can avoid them if you want. As long as you stay away from the well-lit places at night, you'll be okay. But they don't harm you. There's no problem with it. It's just weird as hell, i got to tell you. Yeah, that, that's the thing that I was thinking about. You know, I was talking with a couple of people, and I'm like, you know, look, it's hard to stay away from well-lit areas on the Strip. That's for damn sure. <laughs> but then just 
walking on the sidewalk and, and hearing that endless crunch of them under your feet. I mean, I, I presume at some point you get immune to it, but for the first, you know, day or two that you're out there, just hearing that would be extremely unpleasant to say the least. So hopefully those things get out of there. And I'm sure a lot of people will be going out there to sign up for the bevy of football contest. Uh, Super contest weekend is what I think four weeks away now or something like that. So hopefully those things get out of there uh, before everyone starts to make their summer pilgrimage to get signed up for all the football contests and all that type of thing. And you know what, speaking of football, I'm going to change it up a little bit here. Let's talk NFL first. We've done a lot of college here uh, over the last few weeks on Bang the Book Radio. Let's do some NFL here first because we actually have an NFL game on Thursday night. Broncos and Falcons in Canton, Ohio, the Pro Football Hall of Fame game. This is essentially week zero for the preseason. The Broncos and the Falcons will both play five preseason games. Already announced that Flacco's not going to play. I'd be surprised if Matt Ryan plays, although I haven't seen anything to confirm or deny that. But in terms of the NFL preseason in general, Brian, let's start from a betting standpoint. What are some of the things you look for before you lock in some of these games? Yeah, the the one thing is we always talk about information, and you get better information in uh, spring or excuse me in the uh, preseason games than you do in the regular season because it's just harder to find. So you've really got to follow everybody that uh, writes for all these teams or you follow somebody who follows everybody who writes for these teams and, uh, and, and follow whatever they have to say. You know, I, I happen to know that uh, the Atlanta Falcons have had some, uh, some guys on the front line or the offensive line and the defensive line uh, that are fighting for positions. And that's one of the things that I always take a look at. So normally – early in the preseason that these teams will play, you know, four or five games, especially these teams playing this extra week here. So the first game, you're not going to see any of the starters for very long at all. They may play a series if they play anything at all. And if you were looking to play um, the exhibition games at this point, early on, I would probably want to concentrate on first halves as opposed to full games, because once you get to the third quarter and the fourth quarter, you're going to see guys who are going to be bagging groceries and pumping gas uh, in a few weeks. I don't want to be betting on them. You know, it's hard enough to get the depth on a team that's got, you know, 50 some players on it as opposed to 120, which would be in camp or whatever right now. So uh, I always take a look at the first half early on. Uh, but to be honest with you, I'm not a big uh, preseason guy. If somebody gives me a tip that, um, the starting rotation is going to be a little bit better on this one than on another team. Uh, I'll take a look at it. But the quarterback rotation is what's very important and knowing how long they're going to play. Uh, if you find, obviously, you find uh, a quarterback situation where you've got two or three guys fighting for the position, those are the type of teams you want to play on because when the management sends out the first team's reps, and all of a sudden that guy's going to be out of the game, well, the only way to compete for the first and the second team guys is to have the same players on the field. So you know your starters are going to play a little bit longer in the offensive line. Uh, maybe you get some receivers that play a little bit more than normal. So those are the, usually the things I try to bet on when it comes to the preseason games. But to be honest with you, um, with so much other stuff going on right now, working on college football, it's baseball season. Um, even started some uh, preparation for the NBA for next year. So got a lot on my mind. I don't do a lot for preseason, but if somebody I know has the tip, I'll bet it. Yeah, and, and it's interesting you bring up playing the derivatives and playing the first halves instead. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why – there are a few reasons why this Hall of Fame game has moved on Denver from Pickham to two-and-a-half, and even the two-and-a-halves are heavily juiced. A lot of threes out there in the marketplace now – you know, Denver's probably going to use Drew Locke for the majority of this game. And Drew Locke is a guy that put up very good college numbers, but, you know, a lot of us kind of not sure how he'll translate to the NFL. But what we do know is that the playbook should probably be pretty open for him as they kind of try to evaluate him. First year head coach, Vic Fangio, longtime coordinator, first crack as a head coach. And Dan Quinn, this is his fifth year as the head coach of the Falcons. They've lost eight straight preseason games. They're 0-4 the last two preseasons. So he's not a guy that takes it seriously. Fangio, probably going to be the first time around, wants to get that first win. So that's why you see this line going up from Pickham to 2.5 or 3 
even though Brett Rippon is the guy that's going to close this game out for the Broncos. So, you know, in terms of line movement, Brian, you know, in terms of watching that, seeing what's going on out there in the marketplace, these generally tend to be pretty sharp line moves in the preseason, correct? Yeah, they definitely are. Guys aren't betting the preseason unless they know who's going to play and who's going to play for so long. Uh, you mentioned uh, Atlanta with the 0-8 record. Keep in mind, a lot of people will look at something like that, and I'm not saying it doesn't have any validity, but every year it's different for some of these teams. Uh, if a team comes off of a disappointing season, they may want to get out there and play the starters a little bit longer to build up their their confidence going into the season. Uh, coaching changes, you mentioned Denver. I mean, the situation there, anytime you got a coaching change, they want to come in with a positive attitude and, uh, and start the winning process. You know, that, that's usually what you do is you want to bet on new coaches because they've got something to prove and you get the team behind them and rally around them and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, we used to make a, a fortune betting against the Buffalo Bills years ago uh, with their coaching staff, but, the, you know, that, that doesn't always happen. And he was a guy who, who uh, was there for a long time, and it was his choice if he was going to stay or leave. You don't find that in, in today's NFL, other than the Pittsburgh Steelers, for some reason, continue to extend a bad head coach. Most teams uh, won't do that. Most teams, uh, they're your head coach, unless you're, uh, unless you're New England or Kansas City at this point. Uh, a lot of these guys are, even though you have a good year, you've got to prove it once again the very next year. And uh, so a lot, of, a lot of these things change. So just because a team has got an 0-8 record or whatever the next two years, pay, pay attention to what happened last year and what they're trying to accomplish this year. And I'm not saying it's going to go against it, but it changes each and every year. Yeah, it really does. And, and a couple of interesting things. In fact, I just realized in my preview over at bangthebook.com, I had the Broncos playing the Bears in the title, even though I wrote up the Falcons. So obviously it kind of tells you where, where my mind is right now, <laughs> focusing so heavy on college football. But one thing I can say is that, you know, when, when you look at this game in particular here, and when you look at the situation for the Falcons, as you mentioned, you know, 0-8 in the last two preseasons. Okay, well, in 2017, they were coming off of losing the Super Bowl in devastating fashion. And then going into 2018, they were a playoff team. They were a 10-6 and six team. Last year, they go 7-9. and nine. So maybe, you know, Dan Quinn kind of looks at this preseason in a little bit of a different light and says, you know what, let's go out there and try to win this game. Let's go out there and try to enhance our depth, try to erase the bad memory of that losing record last year, whereas the previous two seasons, they're coming off of double digit wins and playoff appearances. So that's an excellent point that you make there. And a lot of people will look at it and say, well, Dan Quinn doesn't care about the preseason. Maybe he doesn't, but maybe this year it'll be a little bit different coming off of such a disappointing and underwhelming 2018 season. So again, not to say that I'm going to bet Atlanta by any means or anything like that. And I did even mention, you know, taking Denver in the article, but the fact remains, maybe because I didn't know who Denver was playing, but the fact remains that, <laughs> You know, as you said, every year is a little bit different, and we feel like we know what these coaches are going to do in the preseason, but a lot of that may also depend, as you said, on how they finished up the previous year. Yeah, definitely, and, and just the opposite of that would be the Cleveland Browns, a team who for the last few years are just desperate for any win they could get. Now this is a team that people are expecting to win the division. Uh, there's been a lot of money coming in in Vegas on the Browns to win the Super Bowl. Uh, I would not count uh, what they've done in the preseason earlier uh, with different teams that had something to prove. It's totally different than this year. Yeah, for sure. You know, you look at last year, a guy like Baker Mayfield trying to make that impression in the preseason. This year, he's the guy, and we know that already. So, you know, a lot of those different intangibles come into play in the preseason. But one thing I do want to focus on and circle back to before we transition over to the college side, you mentioned this, that, there's a lot more information out there for the preseason. Coaches will tell you how long guys are going to play. Coaches are going to tell you, hey, we don't like the way our offensive line looks in practice. We're going to really focus on running the football this week. They'll tell you those things. Obviously, they're not telling anything in the regular season. So, and following those beat writers on Twitter, very, very important. Reading what the beat writers have to say in article form. Because a lot of times these coaches are going to tell you what's going to happen. And, and more often than not, they're not bullshitting you because they don't need to. That's exactly true. And um, it, it, there's, there's, you'll see during the regular season, 
a lot of coaches will come out and say something like that and do totally opposite because they're trying to uh, obviously confuse the opposition and uh, try to get any edge they can. In preseason, like we said, for the most part, nobody cares. The fans care, but the players may care. I mean, some guys don't like to lose at anything. But really, the coaches are out there trying to evaluate players. Their job isn't to win in the preseason unless you've got a team, like we talked about with the Browns being bad for so many years. Uh, there's certain teams that actually, it, you know, they're coming into the season. Uh, there are teams that uh, are going to uh, take a look at uh, try to win these games. As a matter of fact, you know, usually in the preseason, your lines go from pick them to three for the most part. Uh, during the regular season, they go from pick them to 14 for the most part. Uh, and you could see a lot of times that New England will be a three-point favorite over, let's just say, the Tampa Bay, uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the preseason. Your general fan is going to look at that. Oh, my God, they're only three points over the Bucs. Well, the Bucs are a team that's trying to win some games, and New England's just trying to get out of there without getting anybody injured. It's totally different, and the Lions makers know that, which is why you always see something in the pick range when it comes to the preseason. Now, over on our Bang the Book YouTube page, we've got video previews here from Brian Blessing for the Hall of Fame game and also some NFL preseason betting strategy and tips. And I guess one last thing I want to ask you here, Brian, when we talk about those low spreads, you know, and as you mentioned, a lot of these games going to be – two, two and a half, three, maybe three and a half or four on the high end. Um, key numbers don't really matter as much in the preseason. In fact, they, you know, they may not matter at all. Teams may be working on two point conversion plays, all that type of thing. So what do you do from a, from a betting standpoint? You know, are you just taking underdogs on the money line? If they're two and a half or three, are you just taking favorites on the money line just to avoid any sort of hijinks? I know you said you like to do, a lot of first half stuff, but for full game players that are out there, are you looking more at playing the money lines as opposed to letting the point spreads get involved? Actually, um, the key numbers do make a difference. They're just different key numbers. Uh, during the regular season, we all know that three is the most important number. and um, That's the one that they charge you the extra money to get on. And it's, it's really a bad, a bad situation. Anytime you're buying points, but uh, in the preseason, now people, as you mentioned, people are going, the, the uh, extra point has been pushed back farther. Um, the teams are going for two. Uh, teams don't want an overtime as, a fo- as opposed to the uh, regular season. So you will see teams doing things differently than they would in the, in the regular season to avoid overtime. Uh, in the regular season, three is so important. In preseason, it's really not that important. Ones and twos are actually uh, the the uh, numbers that you want to be looking at. So um, it, it all depends. You know, I don't, I don't have the exact numbers for the preseason. And obviously um, moving the extra point back, it actually makes even more of a difference. But I know, you know, if you're looking for three and somebody's looking to buy all an offer to you, please do not do that. It's even worse in the preseason than it is in the regular season. And keep in mind, teams in the regular season are looking to tie the game to send it to overtime. In the preseason, nobody wants to play extra free football. More chances to get your players hurt. Uh, if it was up to the coaches, they wouldn't even have preseason games. They'd just be playing head-to-head in practice every every week and, and judging their team from that point. So uh, ones and twos mean a lot more in the preseason than they do in the regular season. But just keep that in mind. All right, so we transition over to the college football side of things here. And, uh, you know, it's been a little while since we've chatted, Brian, and I know you've been working hard on your power ratings, working hard on some different things as well, but what is that summer process like for you in terms of starting to evaluate these teams, getting an idea, you know, for your one through 130 for the upcoming college football season? Yeah, I'm unlike uh, maybe Ralph Michaels and especially uh, Brad Powers, where they're working on football all year long. Um, I don't do football until the preseason magazines come out. And, uh, I, I, you know, Brad and Rolf and I share information left and right on a lot of things that we do. And so I'm a little bit ahead of most people before the magazines come out, but I need to have the magazines in front of me. I'm an old school guy, even though things come up on, uh, you can get them on your computer. I still prefer to have the uh, actual magazine in front of me. I do my highlights and everything on that. And uh, that's the thing I work on is, is I start working on power rating reading the reading uh, who came in and who who left. Uh, I'm doing a lot more this year 
in coaching. And I've never done much on coaching in the past, but I know a couple guys out there that I follow on Twitter. And if, if you follow my timeline, uh, you know who I'm following. I mean, I only follow a certain amount of people who I think can make me money. And uh, so if you go through and there's guys in there that are, that are, that are following me that work on the coaching and some other aspects, uh, those are guys that I would recommend to follow also. But spending more time on the coaching than I have in the past, uh, before I was more of a personnel rating situation, uh, talent evaluator, knowing, knowing when uh, people brought in good recruiting classes, how many people are coming back from the previous uh, regime where last year you know, some teams would play 50% seniors going into this. Come, you go back and you look at uh, how many starts they had, and, and Rob Michaels is very good about that where he, he grades out how many starts were seniors, how many were juniors, how many were freshmen and sophomores. And you could see a team, you know, we're not we're only talking about the Big Ten, but Minnesota was a team that played a lot of freshmen and sophomores last year, where you have other teams that have played 55%, 60%, 70% seniors. Uh, so those guys are going to be gone. So that's something you really want to take a look at. And uh, on our site at uh, Wager Talk, uh, Ralph puts a lot of that stuff up there on on a daily basis, and you can go back on his timeline and get some of those numbers. But he does a terrific job. He, he's our guy that we have to put put all that together over at uh, over at our site at, at wagertalk.com, and he does a tremendous job on that. But getting it all together, do, doing the power rating part, getting the coaching part, the talent ratings, and going through and reading about the teams and who's coming back and who's not uh, definitely is how I get ready for the season. Well, let's expand a little bit more on that coaching point, because I think it's really, really interesting. And and it's something you and I talked about off air a little bit. You know, as I go up and down through my power ratings here on a conference by conference basis, I have five teams in the ACC with a rating between 76 and 78, Florida State, Miami, Virginia, Syracuse, and Virginia Tech. It's a similar thing in the Big 12, where I've got, you know, five or six teams within, you know, five or six points of each other. Same thing in the Big 10. Same thing in a lot of these conferences here where the talent gaps aren't as big as they used to be. The haves and the have-nots aren't as well-defined. Yes, you still have Clemson and Alabama types, obviously, but the middle tiers in pretty much all of these conferences are relatively interchangeable. And that's obviously a little bit dangerous because you're talking about coin flip games with home field advantage. So the talent gaps aren't as big. The talent disparity isn't as large as it used to be. Talent is spread more, not just within the conferences, but across the country as well. So I think it makes sense to try and focus on something a little bit different, like coaching, and try to see which guys actually excel at maximizing that talent. And more often than not, those are guys that you're going to want to be on. Yeah, definitely. There are certain teams, and uh, we're going to be talking about the back in a moment. There are certain teams that win close games and other teams who just can't get over the hump. A lot of that is the coaching in that game because the talent levels, as you pointed out, are all basically on the same level. Uh, So we look at the teams that uh, all come down to the coaching, and some guys just can't make the right decisions. We see it all the time in the NBA. Uh, Teams go down, you know, win and lose by five points or whatever. Uh, In the NFL and college football, that's one of the things you take a look at when you're looking at season wins is how many close wins and losses that they have had. A lot of people expect regression, and I would assume regression, but a lot of times it's just that you've got a coaching staff that is just being outcoached in the end of those games, and, and that's one of the reasons why I got into this uh, more of this season with the coaching. And it's not only the coaching for this year, but you're looking at coaching for a few years. Hopefully these guys can stick around for a while. Um, we're not going to talk about Georgia Tech on, the, on this podcast, but Georgia Tech made a drastic coaching differential. I think in the long run, it's going to be best for the Yellow Jackets. They'll be a better team. But this year, he comes in, changing the entire process over there, and he's got all these guys that were brought in for the running option style, and he's got to play with them. So Georgia Tech could end up with a terrible record this season. It could end up with a terrible record next season. And then the guy could get fired, even though they're going in a good direction and, and it'll help them in the long run. That's the only problem you have is somebody's that are hiring these coaches, they don't give them a chance. They bring them in for a certain reason, and then they don't let them play out enough where they can get their own players in there and play the games they like. So 
You've got short-term coaching advantages and disadvantages, and you've got long-term. Some guys uh, in the future, you're going to teams are going to be better and much better than we're set up for the organization than they are now. Problem is, will they be able to be in those positions at that time? Well, and this is a particularly interesting year to be looking at head coaches because there are 27 different head coaches in college football this year, 10 in the Power Five, 17 in the Group of Five. I handicapped all those coaching changes, uh, I believe, in June over at bangthebook.com, so a couple of articles for you to check out there. But, Brian, in terms of evaluating coaching, are you taking this down to a coordinator level as well, or are you just mostly looking at the head guy? No, looking at the head guys and the coordinators. And the unfortunate part in some places is the coordinators have very little experience. Um, if you don't have enough experience, you may have looked really good at where you were at, but if you don't have a database of like three or more years, um, you're going to be downgraded a little bit. Once you get to three years, then you have a solid base. It's sort of like, you know, we talk about small sample sizes. Uh, so once you get three years and above, then you know what you're getting out of it. And, you know, Alabama is one of those guys, one of those teams that they seem to change, uh, coordinators a lot because these guys are picking, getting picked up by other jobs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that a coach, uh, an assistant coach at uh, Alabama who had terrible, a terrible job, Loxley, when he, when he was in New Mexico, did a terrible job. All of a sudden, uh, Maryland's just coming out of the woodwork to give him a head coaching job when he's never been successful as a head coach. He was successful because of uh, the guys he was coaching in college. He couldn't recruit those guys. Those weren't his recruits, but he had the talent to do it. Well, Maryland doesn't have the talent that Alabama has, uh, which is one of the reasons why I don't think it's a, it's an edge for uh, Maryland to have him as the head coach. And a lot of people are excited about it, but the guy has never proven anything as a head coach. Sure, as the coordinator, he's a very good coordinator. But some of these guys, and we see it all the time, in the NFL, they'll hire a guy that was a great coordinator. All of a sudden, he takes that job as the head coach, and he's not any good. I mean, there's so many so many over the years that you've had guys, the, the Chargers just a few years ago, uh, hired one of the best offensive minds in baseball, or excuse me, in football. He's been successful everywhere. He gets the head coaching, and he sucks. I mean, it's a different job. You've got so many different things to do in head coaching as you do as opposed to the coordinators. So just because a guy's been a great coordinator does not make him a good coach, head coach. All right, so we can kind of carry that theme through a little bit here as we head on into the Mid-American Conference. Four teams with new head coaches there in the MAC. Northern Illinois, obviously the most interesting of the four. You also have uh, Central Michigan with Jim McElwain. That one's pretty interesting, too, as a guy with major university experience at Florida. Bowling Green, and then, of course, our lowly Akron Zips, both of us Akron grads. Uh, Akron, one of the worst teams in college football for the upcoming season. But Northern Illinois is interesting to me because I've never really been a Rod Carey fan. And NIU has always had some of the best talent in this conference. They've made it to some pretty impressive bowl games. They have not done well in non-conference or in those bowl games under Carey. And they go with a guy in Thomas Hammock who has no head coaching experience. He was a position coach in the NFL, running backs coach even. Carey gets the job in te at Temple, which I thought was kind of a strange hire. But what about Northern Illinois here? I mean, they have the talent, but I don't know if they have the right guy to maximize it. Yeah, that's the thing is you've got a guy who's had a history of being a, a, a guy who keeps the ball on the ground, but they're trying to spread the offense <clears throat> spread, spread the offense out a little bit this year and try to get more modern. That's been the problem with Northern Illinois. The defense has been terrific over the last few years, but they just don't put enough points on the board. Um, and that's the, that's the problem for Northern Illinois. So they're trying to bring in a little bit different style, but I don't know if he's the right guy. I, I think he can be the right guy because I agree with uh, some of your thoughts about the past with uh, Northern Illinois. But at this point, um, I like the coaching hire, but it's going to take some time to get it to where they want to be. But I understand why they did it, and I think it'll work a lot overall. But you also have to take a look at he wants to play it a little bit faster pace. You want to pass the ball a little bit more. But is how is that going to affect the defense? The defense was used to being off the field for a long time because Northern Illinois would run the football, and they would run it effectively. 
So when the players come on from defense, there is a situation where they come in and they come in fresh. Uh, you see this all the time. Guys will make a move. Teams will make a move. The defense is very good. And then all of a sudden they make they want to spend more time on the offense and, and try to score quicker. But then the defense suffers. So you got to look at it two ways. I'm not overly excited about uh, some of the moves defensively with the defensive coordinator and all. Uh, but um, I think in the long run, it should be able to work out because they recruit better than most of the teams in the league. Although uh, this year they're like right in the middle of the pack, even the lesser part of that from a talent standpoint. So uh, we'll have to see how that works out, but it'll be a definite change from Northern Illinois. Uh, your, your games where you're getting totals in the, in the uh, low forties, maybe gone for Northern Illinois, at least once this offense starts to click. I want to touch on Central Michigan real quick. I mean, obviously there's not much hope for Bowling Green or Akron this year. We can talk about them as the season goes along. But Central Michigan here with Jim McElwain, a guy that built up Colorado State, didn't really do much when he got the big job there uh, at Florida. Now he goes to Central Michigan, where this is one of the least talented teams in the country. I thought they played hard for John Bonamigo, the previous head coach. They didn't have a whole lot of talent with him either. But the talent that they did have is now pretty much out of the program. So what do you do in a situation like that where you have a very experienced head coach, a guy that worked with Nick Saban as an offensive coordinator, had some years running a program, including a really you know blue blood program in Florida. This is a different type of atmosphere for him there up at Central Michigan. So how do you sort of view the Chippewas where maybe the coach is encouraging, but the talent isn't? Well, that's exactly what I have. I have uh, the worst teams in the in the MAC from a talent or from a power rating standpoint. Um, I've got, as you mentioned, I've got Akron 49. I got Central at 50, and uh, I got Kent at 54. Actually, I have a Bowling Green at 49. I forgot about them. Uh, so we've got Bowling Green, Central Michigan, and Akron are the worst. But I like the situation for Central Michigan from a coaching standpoint. Um, the head coach and the offensive coordinator, you know, I can't go down from where they scored 15 points a game last year. So it can't go down much lower than that. So I think the offense will be much better for central Michigan this year. Um, like I said, it, when you take a look at the coaching changes in the league, that's to me, that's the top, uh, coaching change. And, uh, you know, Ohio, U obviously Ohio, U and Toledo and, uh, North, I, I like Northern Illinois more than most people, but Central Michigan, those are your teams that have the better head coaches. And if you've got a better head coach and you've got some quarterbacks coming back, which uh, Central does, they do have their starting quarterback back. But once again, it was a team that only scored 15 points a game last year. So you find a lot of times it's it's similar to people take a look at returning starters. Well, uh, returning starters – are a good thing if they're good returning starters. If they're guys who are lousy coming off of a lousy football team the year before, when you're bringing in the returning starters, is that really a positive? Uh, you know, obviously it is when you've got a good football team, but it's hard to judge when you've got uh, experienced guys coming back from a bad football team. And uh, I think Central right now, early in the season, I think they're a play against team. Uh, as, as the season goes on, I think those are one of those teams where, if you chart um, as the season goes on, I recommend this for a lot of people when you're doing your stats, have a full season chart, have maybe a last five games chart, last two or three games chart, and follow that. And once you see an uptick on the numbers, uh, the important numbers for Central Michigan, that's when you could jump on them. And I think you'd get some nice value on that because, as you mentioned, they hadn't been very good last year. And uh, this year, from a talent standpoint, not the best talent in the conference. So, um, go against uh, the Chippewas early and keep an eye for when that the, the flips to, to flips a little bit, uh, the switch, and then all of a sudden uh, we can start betting on Central Michigan. And, and those are the teams I like because if a team is bad to start the season, for example, Kent State. I'm not a big Kent State fan. I've got them at a 54, which is four higher than Central. But um, their, their coaching staff has some talent, but they, they're not proved, proven at this point. Uh, so that could be a situation where all season long you don't see a whole lot of Kent until maybe the end of the season. You look at a team like Akron, you're probably going to see the same Akron at the end of the season that you see early in the season just because I'm not a big believer in the coaching staff and also the talent level so low. So you're not going to get any value out of teams that remain the same all season long. You get your value 
out of teams that the coaching staff gets more practices in and gets the team up as the season goes on. And you also uh, have teams that start the season with high expectations and then they're halfway through the season and are not playing well. Those are teams that you could fade. And the ones that stay, stay static all season long are really the lines makers have a good line on them and nothing really changes and we don't get a lot of value out of playing those teams. Well, and one other point here about taking maybe smaller sample sizes of data is that some teams in the non-conference are going to play three paycheck games, get their asses kicked, or, you know, maybe play three paycheck games, then play an FCS team, then get into conference play. Now, you certainly want to try and eliminate some of those outliers as much as you possibly can. You know, some teams might play Alabama and lose by 60. Well, what does that mean for them when they go and play a max school? Nothing. It means absolutely nothing because they're playing – a team that's more on their level. So you certainly want to factor that in the equation. When you're looking at year-to-date metrics, you know, maybe they're not the greatest uh, barometer for you because you know, maybe they played three really good Power 5 schools in non-conference play to you know, fill the athletic department coffers a little bit. So that's a very important point to make here uh, as well, Brian. And before we leave the MAC, I want to touch real quickly here. The top of the conference. I actually have the top of the conference – a little bit lower than I usually do. Usually those top teams in the mid 60s, mid to upper 60s for me. This year I've got Toledo 76th in my power rankings, uh, power ratings, Ohio 77th, Western Michigan 78th. So they're all right there together. But I don't think the top of this conference is as strong as it's been in the past. Yeah, I agree. I don't think the conference as a whole is as good as it is in the past. And I'll be looking to fade the Mac in the, in the non-conference games. And, to touch on your last point that you had made, um, it's especially important uh, to take a look at the teams playing the non-conference when you get into like a college basketball, when you play totally different styles like an Air Force. Air Force plays a style that a lot of people in college basketball don't see. So Air Force will look really good in those preseason games, and all of a sudden they get into a regular conference action where they play these teams twice a season, and you can clearly bet against Air Force because those other teams have seen them play and they know how to play that style. You see that all the time, especially in college basketball. So keep that in mind uh, for when when the hoops come around. But, yeah, you're right. I've got uh, three or four teams that are at the top of this league, but I don't have them nearly as strong as they've been in the past. I think Ohio's got the easiest road to the uh, to the championship based on the division that they're in. I've got Ohio rated pretty much the same as a Western Michigan. Uh, Toledo's a couple points less. I think it's basically a – a three-team race, depending on if Northern Illinois, how quick they can get that offense turned around. Um, but, yeah, you've got a top and you've got a bottom. The bottom, you take a look at uh, talent-wise. I mean, we've got Akron at 129. We've got Eastern Michigan at 124. you got Buffalo at 121. Buffalo is going to take a major step back after what they did last year uh, from a talent standpoint. But you've got, you know, I've got, uh, from a talent standpoint, Toledo 74, uh, Western 75. Ohio doesn't have the talent, but they do have the most experienced head coach, uh, a lot of consistency in the Ohio program. And that's a really a big advantage uh, when it comes to these smaller schools is, you know, a lot of times we'll see this, especially in the Sun Belt, uh, your head coaches are there for one or two years. They have success. They're gone. Uh, but or, uh, Coach Solich, for as long as he has played in Ohio, You've got to give him a lot of credit. He sticks with the program. Everybody's very familiar with it. And that's an advantage in these smaller schools that uh, a lot of places don't have because this is really a, a stepping stone for a lot of these head coaches, offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators. They had success in the lower divisions, and then all of a sudden they get promoted, and they're in the middle tier. And then, you know, who knows? Maybe they get up to uh, the Alabama like Oloxy and catch a good break, and all of a sudden they're a head coach in the Big Ten. Yeah, a couple of quick points here. Ohio, I believe the first time in 15 years that Frank Solich has a new coordinator, I believe it's because his defensive coordinator retired. So a lot of stability, a lot of consistency there for Ohio. One other point I want to make, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit here and actually go against your thoughts on Buffalo. I have Buffalo for close to seven wins this year from a season win total standpoint, 6.83 to be exact. I think Lance Leopold is maybe the best coach in this conference. And I think this is a guy that, yes, he does lose a lot of talent. But I think this is the year that he really showcases just how good of a head coach he is. I think he winds up with a lower power five job or maybe a really good group of five job heading into 2020. So 
that's one where I'm kind of giving the coach a little bit of a boost and therefore giving the team a little bit of a boost. We'll see if I'm wrong with that. It's one of the more aggressive positions I've taken, but again, that's one of the things, you know, there can't be differences of opinion in these group of five conferences because that's exactly the question. Do you grade on talent? Do you grade on, you know, who left? I mean, losing Tyree Jackson, who's, you know, maybe an NFL backup kind of caliber quarterback, that's a big loss for a team, but I think they have the right coach. So, you know, there, there can be some big differences of opinion in these group of five leagues. And if you can catch one of them, you can make a lot of money with them too. Yeah, you definitely can. And, and you mentioned Buffalo, they lose two players, a quarterback and a wide receiver to the NFL. And the Mac doesn't get too many players that go to the NFL. And so to lose one, uh, and we've seen this over the years to, to lose one in the, uh, and the match is a big deal to lose, too, which is one of the reasons why the talent level is so low here. But as for the coaching standpoint, I've got them, uh, along with Toledo and, and Ohio, the top three coaching staffs in, in the match. So you, you could be right. You know, We'll see what he does. But, uh, yeah, to lose players to the NFL coming out of, uh, out of the MAC is definitely a drawback. But he's a talented coach, and he's got a nice coaching staff. All right, let's take a look real quickly at the AAC here. I don't want to keep you too long. We got a little bit of a late start because we were just shooting the shit for a little while. Um, in the AAC here, you've got UCF, no Mackenzie Milton. They get Brandon Wimbush, the Notre Dame transfer, and Dariel Mack actually played really well in relief of Mackenzie Milton under some very difficult circumstances. Cincinnati, great year last year under Luke Fickle. Memphis is always strong, always recruits pretty well. The teams that I kind of want to focus on are some of the ones toward the middle of the pack here in this conference, looking specifically at a team like Houston. They've got the quarterback in De'Ara King. They had some losses at other positions, but they bring in Dana Holgerson, a guy who was obviously at West Virginia for a long time, saw the writing on the wall there, decided to bail. How do you sort of envision Houston as a team that I think is down several notches from the talent level of the big three here in this conference? but they do have that proven head coach. Yeah, they do. Uh, good head coach, great offensive coordinator, uh, defensive coordinator is fine. Uh, talent level, I've got them at a 68, which is uh, Cincinnati was 65, UCF 64, 68 for Houston. So they're still one of the top three from a talent level. Um, Paul Reigns, they got them down a little bit lower based, based on uh, some of the losses they've had. But I like the coaching staff. Uh, the, the winning attitude is there. Uh, this is a team, when you take a look at uh, the games of the year that came out earlier this year, I was down there uh, for the Circa when they opened that up and also down at the Golden Nugget. This is a team where guys were jumping on Houston. They thought the uh, Lions were making a too big of an adjustment, and they were betting on Houston. And uh, I, I could see that happening. I think Houston could continue on with what they have done uh, because of the coaching staff that they have. And, and as I mentioned, the talent level is one of the top three in the conference. Uh, Cincinnati is one of those that I like this year. Cincinnati, uh, the head coach that you mentioned, uh, has done a, done a very nice job since he's been there. Talent level is very high. Um, Central Florida is another team where they obviously have to change out the starting quarterback, which was a, a huge differential. But they may not be as dominant as they had been in the past, they're still a very good team. To me, there's the three top teams in this in this conference are the Memphis, uh, Central Florida, and Cincinnati. I give from a coaching standpoint, I think uh, Central Florida, uh, Memphis, and uh, Tulane are probably your strongest coaching uh, staffs in this conference. The only teams that don't really rate on a on a talent level are obviously Connecticut, and then uh, then Tulsa, um, and uh, it's a situation where neither one of those teams are very good. And uh, Tulsa has, doesn't have a talent. I, the, the offensive coordinator for Tulsa is very good, and they'll be scoring some points. Don't know if I like the head coach well enough to, to turn this whole thing around for Tulsa. But if you take a team, uh, the conference as a whole, and we talked about the MAC earlier, a team, a uh, conference where I thought was going to be down a little bit, I think the AAC is one of those that's going to be up a little bit. And I think we can make some money on some of these teams playing in these non-conference games. Um, really, the top portion of this this uh, league is very good. The middle portion is very good. So other than, uh, you know, a couple of teams at the bottom, um, 
that uh, definitely had some problems. I, th- I think as a, as a whole, this uh, this uh, entire conference could make us some money in these non-conference games. You know, I think what's really interesting about this conference is that you, know, you have some teams in some very, very good recruiting areas. You've got Central and South Florida, obviously in the Sunshine State, Cincinnati and Ohio. Ohio's a top five school or top five state for high school football. Houston, SMU, both of those teams in the state of Texas. There's some recruiting to be had here, but you've got some teams that really maximize that talent and others that don't. You know, a team like SMU is kind of waiting. You know, year in and year out, they've got a player or two that is a legit, can't miss NFL caliber player, and then they just don't have the supplemental cast around them. UCF kind of the same way here now, um, you know, with some of the losses that they've had, losing their running backs, losing their quarterbacks, losing head coaches. You kind of wonder, though, about those two teams. They have the talent. You just you don't know when they're going to make that leap. Yeah, uh, that's something you've got to keep track of. And uh, one of the reasons why I break them down by certain, you know, by certain situations. Uh, the East Carolina hire. Love the East Carolina hire. The only problem is that uh, from an offensive and defensive standpoint, from the coordinators, they just have an incomplete uh, situation because they haven't been around long enough. But I think East Carolina is one of those teams that they, they've been so bad for so long. Defense has been horrendous. Offense could put up some points in the past, but East Carolina is a team that I think can sneak up on some people this year. And oh, they're going to be getting you know big points in a lot of these games. You know, I'll be getting 20 points against some of these teams, but they're a team that uh, I think as the season goes on, we can make some money on. Um, South Florida is one of those that I'm a little bit disappointed in a little bit. I, I don't like the defensive coordinator at, uh, at South Florida. Um, coaching, eh, about average. Uh, but uh, some of these other teams, uh, uh, Tulane, I think, is a team that is on the up. I like, as I mentioned, I like their entire coaching staff. Temple, um, don't know about the defensive coordinator, but from the offensive standpoint, I think they'll be a little bit better. There's going to be some money makers out here in the AAC. I like East Carolina quite a bit, too. There's one more team I want to ask about here in the AAC, and then I'll let you go for the day. Navy. You know, Navy is a team I hammered their season win total under last year, largely because of the schedule that they played. They played a miserable, brutal, awful travel schedule. But I find that I don't like them again here this year. In fact, I have one of the biggest gaps in my power ratings and my projected spreads between Navy's market win total and my season win total. And this is one of those situations, you kind of alluded to this earlier, and this is why I wanted to talk about it, Air Force and college basketball. They play that style that you don't really see in the non-conference. They get to conference play where teams know them, and all of a sudden they don't have as much success. It's the same thing for Navy here, being in a conference where teams see them every single year, and now they can better prepare for the option. Maybe in non-conference games, it still helps Navy a little bit, although two of their non-conference games, Air Force and Army, who are just better at what they're doing than Navy is at this point in time. I have Navy very, very low this year. I'm curious if I'm just too low on them, maybe too jaded off of last year, or if you have them pretty low as well. I have them 108th in my power ratings, and I only have them down for about 4.2 wins. Yeah, I, I'm the same way with Navy. I, I love the head coach, love the offensive coordinator, like the, everything about it. But it's a team that didn't play very well last year, and teams are catching up to them. And as you mentioned, uh, when was the last time we saw Navy? Probably the third best military school. It uh, doesn't happen very often. Uh, I also have Navy uh, rated down low. Uh, Connecticut, obviously, is in a group by themselves. But Navy and East Carolina, I have lower. But I think East Carolina has a much higher ceiling than Navy has. And uh, the public knows Navy. That's a, that's a household name. So you know, once the, the public gets involved with some of these games early in the season, as you pointed out, um, there'll be some value going against Navy. And uh, good point about them getting into this conference and, uh, and playing that way because it's, we find the same way, obviously, in the Mountain West with Air Force. Um, they know what's coming. And they, the thing is, in the Mountain West, they don't have the defenses to stop what's coming with Air Force. So they continue to have uh, a, high, a high profile and can score a lot of points. Um, what the thing is, is the ACC defense is better than the uh, better than the Mountain West. I believe they are. Uh, for for some of them are still pretty bad defenses, but some of them are pretty good defenses. So there's going to be times where that that Navy, Navy uh, option just doesn't work like it like it has in the past. So that's something to keep 
keep in mind. And uh, yeah, if you're not if you're not dividing maybe from uh, their non-conference play into the conference play, uh, that would be a mistake that could probably cost you some money come uh, conference time. Brian Leonard, professional handicapper over at wagertalk.com. What do you guys got going on over there right now, man? Uh, it's really exciting time. Uh, we just, I don't know if anybody's matching up here, if you've had her off on the show. That, uh, we bought the gold sheet. Uh, we're now uh, owner of the gold sheet, so we're going to be putting that out this year. Uh, a lot of major things going on. Sports Grid is one of these uh, uh, FanDuel sites that um, they have, I do you know, this this week. I've done it three days. This week we have a, a, a website on on a Sports Grid where we're uh, going over in-game betting, which I think is the way to go uh, from now forward in the in these games. We talked about preseason betting. I mean, Jesus, can you imagine preseason betting in college in NFL football? with live betting, knowing who's going to be in there. I mean, that, was, that would be a tremendous edge. We'll have to see how that works out. But, but I've been on there giving out edges uh, with a couple of well-known hosts, and we do that uh, from a podcast standpoint, also on video on, uh, on Sports Grid. Looking for an exciting season. And I'm, uh, I'm, uh, looks like I'm going to be having a, a biggest uh, baseball play in a while. I've been very good on these 5% plays, I believe, like 23 and 7. Uh, I'm going to have one later on today. This game I really like, a uh, very reasonable range, and that's going to be up for sale on the site. And if it doesn't win, you get 150% of the cost of that uh, pick back into your betting account. So uh, it's uh, it's a good day to visit over at uh, Wedger Talk right now. And, and check out, as I mentioned, uh, we've got a lot of good contributors, Ross on there. Um, and check out some of those things I've talked about that he's uh, put up there for college football. They're Tremendous, and uh, you put it up nice and early, we can get a head start on it. And then Kevin for this college football season. Well, of course, as always, it's a good day to follow Brian on Twitter, at B. Leonard Sports. Brian, appreciate the time, as always, man. Thank you so much for joining me. Good to talk with you again, and we'll be doing it a lot more often here soon. Sounds terrific. Best of luck to everyone. There you go. There's professional handicapper Brian Leonard from wagertalk.com, at B. Leonard Sports on Twitter. Coming up on Wednesday, we'll spend about 20 minutes talking NFL with Ross Tucker, former NFL player and of the Ross Tucker podcast family. Uh, That should be a good one. Thursday, the Betters Box talking MLB. Friday, Christian Pina chatting UFC. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.